Hey soulmates, it's the day before the weekend and I'm feeling it, or the start of the weekend. I'm ready for it. It's, it's Friday Eve. That's it, that's what they call it. And of course, we have so much to discuss with you today on this Thursday, including arrest made in Alabama in connection to that deadly birthday party shooting. And the five children we've talked about, they're finally being returned to their parents. That's happening in Georgia. Welcome to Fox Souls Black Report. I'm Courtney Hicks. And I'm the Cordelia Corte. Plus, the black leaders looking to make the cannabis industry more equitable. <laughs> and 50 Cent says he's done with stars. They're the stories that impact our people. We're going to bring you our news, our views, and our voice. So let's get into our top conversation of the day. The family of Tyree Nichols has filed a $550 million lawsuit against the city of Memphis and its police department for his death. Tyree's mother held a press conference this week, and she says she wants justice for her son. Those five police officers murdered my son. They beat him to death. And they need to be held accountable along with everyone else that has something to do with my son's murder. You might remember those five officers that were fired and indicted on criminal charges. The lawsuit claims the beating was a result of the city's unconstitutional policies and deliberate indifference towards police brutality. Lawyers even compared the beating to the killing of Emmett Till. The U.S. Department of Justice is now reviewing the Memphis Police Department. You know, you know, salute to uh, the mother of Tyree Nichols, mm -hmm. uh, who is still grieving the loss of her son, to channel that pain into action, as we've seen so many other mothers of the movement do. We just uh, had the mother of Eric Garner yeah. on our show earlier this week, um, who in her own way is doing the same thing. Um, this is important stuff, and this sends a very clear message to police departments across the country. $550 million, mm -hmm. you know, that's nothing to snuff at. And, you know, if they're successful in terms of holding the city of Memphis and the Memphis Police Department accountable, think about what that could mean for police departments with officers that go rogue, uh, police officers where uh, supervisors are turning mm -hmm. a blind eye to what they're doing, these, mm -hmm. these special tactical units like the Scorpion unit. Imagine what impact this lawsuit could have. And I just think about the strength and the perseverance and the faith that these mothers of the movement, these mothers of this unfortunate club uh, have to just continue to have and tap into. I mean, we know that her son's life is over, but her life without him is just beginning. We're talking about days upon days of, of, you know, court appearances, you know, evidence, information and details that are going to be very heartbreaking and hard to hear. So it's it's the strength that uh, I'm just uh, in, in awe about. And, yeah. and we hope the best for her and she gets what she deserves. Absolutely. Which is justice. Yeah. A Houston man, Brian Michael Garty, has been charged with threatening California Representative Maxine Waters with racist voicemails. Gardy allegedly threatened to, quote, bust her upside her head and accuse Waters of causing controversy. He was arrested on April 13th and was expected to be released after posting a $100,000 bond. Gardy is also suspected of leaving threatening voicemails for two other congresswomen of color. This isn't the first time Waters has received threatening messages as she was previously targeted with a death threat and racist slur in 2021. Look, uh, you can you can try to raise up against Auntie Maxine if you want to. You you will see the whole culture uh, come after you. But really, it just speaks to how treacherous times are uh, when you're when you're dealing with people who. Uh, don't like you because you look different from them or don't like you because you have different perspectives or come from, you know, different walks of life. And uh, it is just unfortunate that we can't, uh, that old adage, agree to disagree and that it within that disagreement, find some kind of common ground so you can live your life the way you're entitled and choose to live your life. And I can live mine without there being such hate and, and evil and discord between between us between us. Yeah, it also says a lot about the strength and courage of Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Mm -hmm. She is not new to the national stage. Right. She has been the target the of threats. attacks That's for a right. long time. Uh, she's even received uh, attacks directly from the Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. right? And and that was you know way back when. And so she she wasn't backing down then, and she's not backing down now. All right, the Supreme Court has ruled in favor of Texas death row inmate Rodney Reed, allowing him to continue fighting for his freedom. 
Reed has been seeking to overturn his sentence since 1996 and has been requesting DNA testing of crime scene evidence to exonerate him. In a 6-3 decision, SCOTUS sent Reed's case back to a lower court to reconsider his constitutional challenge to the state's law of uh, DNA evidence. Now, Reed was sentenced to death for the 1996 murder of 19-year-old Stacy Stitz, but he has long maintained that her fiance, Jimmy Fennell, uh, was the real killer. The case has drawn support from celebrities and lawmakers alike. I mean, what's so interesting about this is that there's no statute of limitations on justice, right? right? And all he's saying is, you know, test the DNA evidence at the mm -hmm. scene. You know, it will prove that, you know, it wasn't me. Uh, and it's interesting that the majority opinion from the Supreme Court was written by Justice Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. right? He was one of the only Republicans, you know, that sided with, with Reed, um, you know, uh, Clarence Thomas and, and the rest uh, did not. Um, and so, you know, we're gonna see where this case goes, you know, but you would think a man's life uh, is in peril. Mm -hmm. uh, and if this bit of evidence could, you know, prove that he is innocent, mm -hmm. um, you know, why not allow him to do that? This idea that, well, you didn't ask soon enough, you know, uh, you know that seems uh, pretty consistent with the, um, uh, the, the way that folks have been playing, uh, particularly in the South. He's been asking since 1996. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe he's been granted stays over the year. This is 2023. And of course, we know uh, DNA testing has, has changed and has improved over, you know, the decades. And, you know, if someone is saying, hey, 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 since 1996, there's something to that. And, and the fact that he is still here amongst us says something about the folks who keep denying his justice or his freedom and justice that maybe something is there to take a look at. Uh, it just needs to, you know, follow through and come to the point where if he is innocent, that, uh, you know, he is exonerated and, mm -hmm. and gets whatever some of his life, whatever much of his life back that he can get. Yeah. 1996. It's a long time. Yes. Well, the Supreme Court is pushing its decision on the abortion pill, mifeprestone, until at least Friday. Justice Samuel Alito issuing the order to allow the pill to stay on the market unrestricted in states where it is legal. Earlier this month, a Texas judge suspended the FDA approval of the drug and all decisions the agency had taken to regulate it. We'll continue to follow this and let you know what happens next. We talked a, a little bit about this yesterday um, as we, we, we you know, got into the, the fight for, for women's uh, rights and, and health, and reproductive health. And, and, and I'll just say it again, you know, whether you agree or not mm -hmm. with, you know, a, a woman's choice to keep or abort, uh, I believe that it, it, it is her choice to do what she chooses to do uh, with her body. And, and I even mentioned across all, you know, medical lines, if you will, not just as far as you know, reproductive uh, measures are concerned, but we should not be fighting for the right to, to do with our body as we as we choose. And there's an element of cruelty to this. I mean, you know, mefaprestone is used for by women who have had miscarriages, That's right. right? And so, you know, if the court, you know, makes it illegal mm -hmm. for everyday people to have access to this drug, mm -hmm. you know, you're forcing women to carry their pregnancy to term. You know, you're, and, and that comes with a whole lot of of uh, medical and emotional risk to women. Yeah. Uh, also, the FDA's independence, it also hangs in the balance. The, the FDA uh, is, has an independent expert authority, and that authority is being challenged. And so, you know, if the court is successful with this, what does it mean, you know, for, you know, folks that take pills, you know, for all sorts of other issues? You know, what, is that, what does it mean, you know, uh, for people that rely on hormone therapy, for people that rely on birth control? Mm -hmm. So there are far-reaching consequences here. Sure. All right, let's move the conversation to Alabama, where police have made arrests in the deadly mass shooting that happened at a birthday party. Three people, including two teens, are charged with murder for the shooting at a Sweet 16 party in Dadeville, where four people were killed and 32 others injured. While a motive is still under investigation, the teens who you see here will be tried as adults and both will likely face additional charges in the coming weeks. Prosecutors say they will ask a judge to hold the teens arrested without bail. Heartbreaking the court of all the way around when you think about this story. It's terrible, it's terrible. The, the, the young girl who was celebrating her sweet 16, on her sweet 16, she's holding her brother yeah. 
in her arms mm -hmm. and she's watching her brother take his last yes. breath. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, how is any other birthday going to be, you know, normal after having that sort of traumatic experience? And then, mm -hmm. you know, for these teens, you know, 16 years old, you know, 18 years old, you know, facing, you know, these counts of murder in Alabama, mm -hmm. they're going to be tried as adults in Alabama. You know, you know, you know, if they are convicted, you know, their life is over. And so, you know, so many young lives cut short and, and disturbed in the most tragic way, and for what? And the challenge of that community trying to move on because you have the victims and the families of, of the victims, and then you have the families of those accused, you know, and I'm sure, you know, these are all peers and, and they, you know, live in the same neighborhoods, attend the same schools and, and functions and things of that nature. That is very hard to, to move forward. And, and, and there's just a lot of hurt and, and just a lot of physical trauma happening happening right now as people try to recover uh, and, and then others are, are burying their loved ones to try to move into this whole thought of forgiveness. That's very, very tough. Mm -hmm. But but my prayers for the community as they try to come together, both sides, um, and, and move on and heal from this uh, very, very tragic, unfortunate event. Very tragic, very unfortunate. Yeah. Well, three young black girls known as the Oliver Three were strangled and left in a pond last summer in East Texas. No one has been arrested in a case that experts and advocates think was poorly handled by local authorities. The girls were reported missing on July 28th, 2022 in Atlanta, Texas. Now, hours later, on July 29th, all three bodies were found in a nearby pond. Autopsy reports revealed the manner of death for all three girls was homicide, indicating evidence of strangulation. The Cass County District Attorney's Office is currently working with the Texas Rangers and the Sheriff's Office to investigate the murders. About time. I mean, this has been ongoing for months now. And, um, you know, I, it, it's our duty, and we, as we mentioned even yesterday's show at Fox Hills Black Report, to continue to make sure these stories are top of mind mm -hmm. uh, for our community, uh, for our culture. When you talk about missing and exploited black children, look, there's only like 13, a little over 13 percent of black people who make up, you know, black folks here in, in the United States. Forty percent of missing folks are of color. Mm -hmm. And then when you break it down a little bit more, there's like a little over 30 percent are black kids. That is, those are, numbers are huge. And, you know, for, for, for a lot of those cases to still be unsolved and have gone cold, like this case sort of kind of did for yeah. a moment until people started digging again, is inexcusable. It is inexcusable, and that's exactly what activists are saying. That's why they're calling on the, uh, the Department of Justice to mm -hmm. investigate this case. Mm -hmm. It's really strange that you had local authorities say, well, you know, this is a small town, you know, and we don't have the resources to investigate three murders, right, at a time. And so so that was strange. It was also strange that, you know, authorities said that th the three girls drowned, mm -hmm. you know, when the autopsy said, well, Clearly. no, there was evidence of strangulation yeah. and laceration to their faces. And so, you know, this is just another reminder to your point mm -hmm. of the national statistics that tell us that 60,000 black women are missing and black women are twice as likely than to appear uh, as uh, homicide victims. Right. Uh, and so, you know, oftentimes our Black women and girls are overlooked as homicide victims, and this is case in point. Indeed. All right, a new court filing uh, by a Mississippi sheriff says that serving, serving, serving an arrest warrant on Carolyn Bryant Donham, a white woman involved in the 1955 kidnapping that led to the lynching of black teenager Emmett Till is pointless. Now, last year, a grand jury decided not to indict Donham on the charges of kidnapping and manslaughter, Till's cousin Priscilla Sterling wanted LaFleur County Sheriff Ricky Banks to serve the 1955 warrant on Donham and filed a federal lawsuit to make it happen. However, Banks's attorney asked the judge to dismiss the suit, saying the grand jury found no probable cause to support the warrant. The lynching of Teal, who was accused of making improper advances on Donham, became a catalyst for the civil rights movement. And I wonder, what was the makeup of this grand jury? You might remember that the jury that presided over the Emmett Till case was an all-white jury. Um, and what adds insult to injury, weeks after Till's body was found, mm -hmm. you know, and after the all-white jury acquitted Roy Bryant uh, and someone else, months later, the men confessed, confessed in a paid interview 
uh, that they did it, mm -hmm. right? And so there's no question as to who killed uh, Emmett Till, right? Uh, and you know, you would think that you know, that would breathe new life into this mm -hmm. call to serve that warrant, right? I mean, there's supposed to be law enforcement. You can't be law enforcement if you're picking and choosing mm -hmm. when you're gonna enforce the law, right? There's a warrant that is decades old mm -hmm. that was never served that would have made a difference in this case. Right, listen, this is what, 50 some odd years old, this, this very tragic uh, case, which, which really shifted uh, our culture, our people, and moved us into, into a movement. And after all of these years, it just still amazes me how deep the story runs and all the layers that continue to be pulled back and we're talking about 50 plus years ago. So you just can't, you can't stop at the horrific, you know, murder of Emmett Till. You have to unpack this entire uh, story that keeps on storying, if you will. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Fuji's member, Praz Michel, testified in his conspiracy trial for illegal campaign contributions to Barack Obama's campaign. Praz arrived to court and admitted to receiving $20 million in 2012 uh, from J. Ho Lo, but claimed he felt it was free money and not intended as a foreign campaign contribution. <laughs> Michelle also admitted to giving $800,000 to his friends as straw donors, giving them access to Obama's fundraisers. He denied knowing that his actions were illegal. Michelle is also charged with assisting Lo in persuading the Trump administration and Chinese officials. Lo remains on the run. Come, uh, come on, ghetto superstar. You listen. I, when this story first broke, I was just interested to know, you know, how was he able to move from, you know, hip hop superstar because the Fugees were with that deal still are uh, t into these into these circles. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm waiting for the Netflix or the Hulu documentary because I I'm really interested to see how he was able to ma to maneuver uh, and be in the company of these people where they're trusting him with these funds and or believing that, you know, if they gave him money he could get them to the people that they wanted to get to. I find it absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's important to note that, you know, Pross says he felt like the funds were free money. <sighs> and he testified that the lump sum was intended to be a foreign campaign contribution um, and, but in, and as a payment for service. And so he said that money was never, you know, given to the Obama campaign. That didn't happen. Um, and so you got to wonder, you know, if, if the money was never used for how, you know, one individual intended it, you know, um, why is he on trial? But there's always strings. You've got to know there's always strings. All right, coming up, making the cannabis industry fair for all this 420. That's right. We'll introduce <laughs> you to the black leaders who are doing the work and making a change. You're watching Fox Souls Black Report. We'll be right back. And we welcome you back to Fox Souls Black Report. Five children from Georgia who were taken from, taken from their parents during a traffic stop in Tennessee almost two months ago have finally been returned home. That's right. During the stop, state troopers found five grams of marijuana and arrested Deontay Williams while waiting for his bail to be posted. All five children were taken from their parents. Now, the Department of Children's Services received an order to remove the children from their parents' home because of alleged neglect. Now, after several organizations and politicians spoke out, the children were finally brought home. The family's lawyer said they plan to hold a celebration and a press conference in about a week. And I'm hoping that, you know, press conference may entail maybe a, a lawsuit or two. You know, I, I do believe that there were some infractions uh, there. Um, and I'm just glad these, these babies are back home. We mentioned this story yesterday. Day. They were traveling from uh, Georgia uh, through Tennessee to get to Chicago for a family funeral and were stopped with a very minute um, amount of, of marijuana. And we know from state to state those laws are very different. But for these kids to be taken away uh, was a bit drastic. It was drastic. And they, it's, it's important to emphasize they were babies, age seven, yep. five, three, two, and four months. And certainly there are a number of parents out there that may partake mm -hmm. uh, in cannabis. Uh, but this seemed like a really drastic move by uh, the Department of Children and Family Services. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to wonder, you know, um, if this was a white family, would they have uh, taken those kids away? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's no secret that there are 
plenty of black kids. Uh, black kids are overrepresented in the Department of uh, Child and Family uh, mm -hmm. Services, Children and Family Services, overrepresented in foster care. And so why is that exactly? Why is it that, that uh, DCFS resorted to this such extreme measure mm -hmm. for just a small Maybe amount of cannabis? Maybe it's because if you're black and you smoke weed, there's no way you could be a good parent. Just saying. Well, New York first, New York's first legal 420 celebration is happening this year as the state observes the unofficial holiday for cannabis users with the opening of eight, count them, eight legal adult use dispensaries. The New York Office of Cannabis Management has launched a safety awareness campaign urging consumers to only buy their cannabis from state licensed dispensaries. The campaign aims to educate the public on the importance of purchasing legal and safe cannabis products. The office's policy director, John Kagia, spoke about the changes this year and the campaign. Okay, so before, like, this is why I asked you, were you excited about 420? Because this is happening in your hometown. 420 <laughs> marijuana celebrations return today in San Francisco with an estimated 20,000 people expected to attend. After a two-year hiatus, because of course of the pandemic, thousands gathered at Hippie Hill in Golden Gate Park for cannabis celebrations. The big difference this year from years past is that people uh, could buy marijuana at the event. That means only those 21 and over were allowed in. Officials are also asking attendees to respect the park, surrounding neighborhoods, and each other. All right. Black cannabis industry leaders are making strides towards creating a more equitable industry. These change makers come from a variety of backgrounds and companies, each with a unique focus on promoting diversity and inclusion. Some of the leaders highlighted include Troy Datcher, CEO of The Parent Company, and Amber E. Center, CEO of Maker House and chairman of the board and executive director of Supernova Women. Other leaders include Darnell Smith, founder and CEO of MXXN, and Cassia Graham, director of community and strategy at Canaclusive. These leaders are working towards rectifying the problems created by the failed war on drugs and creating generational wealth for black and other minority communities. We sure do love to see it. What a difference, what a difference policy change can make. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of more change that's needed, especially specifically designed to teach and protect you know our culture because of you know the stigma we just you know read the story about the the family uh, with their kids being taken away with that small amount of marijuana and maybe the stereotypes that those authorities tapped into in regards to taking those kids but you know on 420 day you would expect all kind of great conversations surrounding making sure that we get an equal uh, piece of the pie it needs to continue you know as it sounds like the conversation is but I was I was trying to understand where 420 came from because if you don't part take you really forget 420 and what it's all about but uh, again your neck of the woods in California some some high schoolers in the 70s they were stoners and they and they would always meet at 420 after school to to partake and so you know that's where I'm hearing uh, the whole 420 concept came from uh -huh. so there you have it because yeah. I was I was curious as what what it what it why you know i was thinking of something with snoop i know he he's he's made it an infamous type of a day but i really wanted to know what the origins were and and that's what it appears to be i mean that's the yeah. the hood myth yeah yeah and I, i've heard that one uh, as well mm -hmm. and for them for the folks that are watching in the san francisco bay area i am hearing erica badu is expected to perform oh. um at the event at golden gate park and so you know um have fun mm. be safe right and uh happy 420. And puff puff on. <laughs> All right. Up next, Fox O's Black Report uh, giving Howard the tools they need to succeed. That's Howard University. That's right. We'll tell you which politician is set to give the university millions of dollars for research. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I wonder who it is. More when we come back. You're watching Fox O's Black Report.
welcome back to Fox Old Black Report. Well, U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg recently paid a visit to Howard University to highlight the Department of Transportation's $10 million grant to the university. That's a lot of money. It's all in support of ongoing research in transportation safety and to help build a pipeline of transportation leaders. Now, the grant will be distributed over the course of about five years, in addition to student recruitment efforts that will start at the middle school level. Howard University will have a hand in researching education tactics that reduce impaired or distracted driving, reducing bias and traffic enforcement, and creating safer city streets. Prairie View A&M, Oregon State, North Carolina A&T, and Florida A&M universities all receive funding. So not just Howard. I was going to say. <laughs> Because, you know, I was like, come on, you know, we love the Mecca. Yes. But there are a plethora of HBCUs. You want to spread the love. That's right, who could use the attention and the love and the money and the resources. And so sometimes you only hear of a few, Morehouse, Spelman, Howard, you know, uh, you know, Hampton every now and again, you know, getting the love. And so it's good to hear that, that the department has, you know, spread that spread that thing. And out. this is a big deal because recently we reported right here on Fox Hole's Black Report that the Congressional Black Caucus had challenged Secretary Buttigieg to yeah, do more right. around reducing bias in traffic stops, mm -hmm. recognizing that black folks are disproportionately impacted, mm -hmm. you know, by those traffic stops. Uh, we've reported on so many stories where those traffic stops have gone from zero to 100 yeah. and somebody ends up dead, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, the the community ends up feeling uh, as if uh, there is a lack of safety. And so the fact that he's engaging our HBCUs in being a part of the solution, yeah. he's giving us the resources mm -hmm. to be a part of the solution, to, to, to create some research where the government can then take some action. And now Buttigieg has receipts. He, he says, bam, here you go. Here's some answers. Yeah. And he's going to have some receipts when he gets questioned or called out on the carpet again. And I appreciate one of the things that Buttigieg said is that simply earmarking hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure research and construction won't undo decades of systemic racism. And so he's talking that talk and mm -hmm. walking that walk. And I think there are a lot of, of politicians out there. There are a lot of folks in appointed and elected positions mm -hmm. that could do a whole lot more. And so we got to give credit where credit's due. Speaking of walking, graduation season is here, and to celebrate the achievement of more than 27,000 HBCU students, black leaders and 78 schools are joining forces virtually during the Show Me Your Walk HBCU edition. It's hosted by Kevin Hart with guest appearances uh, for the two-hour event. It will include uh, Steve Harvey, Chris Paul, and our very own Foxhole's Vivica Fox. Hey girl, hey. Just to name a few, former President Barack Obama will also share a special special message with the graduates. And to keep the experience uh, hyped, uh, HBCUs uh, is gonna do their thing. You know how we get down. Anthony Hamilton, Wyclef Jean, as well as Drumline, uh, Drumline Mashup featuring Dougie Fresh uh, is set to keep the party moving. When it, when it comes time to walk across that stage, and it's so funny because they, you know, the, 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 the master or mistress of ceremony always says, hold your applause, and they give out all the rules. Do we follow them? Absolutely not. But we are you know going what? to shout, we are going to dance, we're gonna backflip, we're gonna clap whether we're in the stands or walking across the stage. But a big part of the a reason, great moment. a big part of the reason why it's such a big moment when we walk across that stage, mm -hmm. we don't look like what we've been through. That's right. You know, and if folks only knew what it took mm -hmm. and what it also meant mm -hmm. to families. The village. I mean, oftentimes, you know, there are a lot of folks that may be first generation or barely second generation right. in their family right. to, to do that walk. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's great that so many celebrities are using their platform to lift up yeah. these thousands and thousands of HBCUs. And, and I'm really glad that, you know, that the HBCU, uh, you know, officials, you know, allow those young people to, you know, to have their moment. And I know sometimes at uh, PWIs it's it's forbidden, and you sort of kind of get chastised a little bit if you if you move from outside of the norm, if you will. Um, but here at HBCUs, that's another element that I think I, I missed. You know, not choosing to to to, to go to Spelman was just the self-expression being understood. And, and you're not having to explain why you might be a little bit more happier than your, you know, other counterpart 
who may not have had a tough time moving through the academics to get to a graduation as, as you did. So it's, well, it's good to see that welcomed and celebrated. Well, you know, even though I went to a PWI, University of Southern California, Same here. I did participate in our black graduation and folks, in fact, I spoke at our black graduation. And so we had a little bit of, of, of a taste of what that experience might be like mm -hmm. at an HBCU. And so uh, you had a separate, you guys had a separate. We sure black? did. Really? We sure, and still do. Really? Uh-huh. And it's organized by the, is it sanctioned by the school it, or is that something that you guys, like the Black Student Union get, gets together? The Black Student Union, the Center oh, wow. for Black Cultural Student Affairs, you know, Corliss Bennett, Dr. Corliss Bennett was a big part of making that happen and, mm -hmm. and uh, it was one of the most memorable experiences I had during graduation. I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh -huh. We love it when we celebrate us. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of graduation, walks and season, former New Orleans mayor and president of the National Urban League, Mark Morial has been selected to deliver the 2020 commencement speech for the spring graduates at Southern University and A&M College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The graduation will be held on Friday, May 12th. Morial, the national president of the Urban League, just released the organization's State of Black America report. To learn more, visit stateofblackamerica.org. All right, congrats to him. Uh, some sad news uh, here. Legend Dairy jazz musician Ahmad Jamal has passed away. Jamal is noted for adding to jazz's original creativity with his unique piano style. Uh, he's received the National Endowment for the Arts Jazz Master Award, a Lifetime Achievement Grammy, and induction into France's Order of Arts and Letters. His piano style stood out against the then new bebop, which was taking over jazz when Jamal began his career during his teenage years in the 1940s. Jamal's a body of work has been sampled by the likes of Jay-Z, the late gang star, uh, De La Soul, and it's the intro to the hip-hop classic The World Is Yours by Nas. The legendary musician was 92. What an incredible legacy that he leaves behind, and mm -hmm. I love that it's an intergenerational legacy. That's right. It obviously meant so much to his peers, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he meant even more, you know, to uh, generations after his. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm now thinking back to those songs that you referenced. I'm like, oh. Yeah, those are know, all samples. You know, I didn't know that those mm -hmm. were sampled by him. And so, mm -hmm. uh, in his honor, I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen to those. Yeah, what I find so fascinating show. about the story is that no matter where you entered in, generationally speaking, there was always some kind of challenge or uh, there was always somebody who had next. So, there was always the next best thing. So, jazz was that deal, you know, when, when you talk about the evolution of black music, when you get to jazz. It was that deal. And so for this uh, uh, up-tempo, bebop-y, hip hop -y stuff to come along, uh, like be bebop, that just took over. And for him to still be able to survive that mm -hmm. and still had really a, a great, illustrious career up into his passing um, is just amazing when you talk about perseverance and just being able to uh, adjust instead of giving it the side eye. Because um, when bebop came around, much like rap music, them folks didn't like that. Mm -hmm. and it took it put a lot of people out of business. So very interesting story there. May he rest in peace. Indeed. Still ahead, Curtis 50 Cent Jackson says he's fed up, <laughs> fed up with stars. Well, 50 has been talking about this for a minute. What he says he regrets about the partnership, plus other entertainment headlines. Just for you soulmates when we come back, you're watching Fox Soul's Black Report. Welcome back to Fox Soul's Black Report. Well, Jamie Foxx remains hospitalized a week after suffering an unspecified medical complication. Yeah, his daughter took to social media last week to announce that her father had been hospitalized but was on his way to recovery. Now, the actor is reportedly having multiple tests run uh, at a Georgia hospital, but still no spe spe specifics on exactly what has happened. Uh, fellow actors in the industry are posting messages of love and photos with the star um, from the likes of Kerry Washington all the way to uh, Viola Davis. And, and it's a bit alarming because like our, our one of our producers, Neil, mentioned in our morning meeting, you know, these entertainers, his peers, have been given the memo because they are going really hard with these prayers and thoughts, as they should, but it kind of gives somebody from the outside watching in that it's, it's a little bit more serious than maybe how the daughter presented it on social media. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know, 
Jamie Foxx is he's in his 50s. He's mm. a black man. We we've, re we've reported on this show in terms of, you know, some of the the health challenges that, mm -hmm. you know, folks experience, whether you're rich and famous or not, but just, you know, black men and longevity. Uh, and so who knows what it is? We're, we're keeping a close you know, eye on this. We're curious people. So we, we want to know. We're curious people. We want to know. But I think, yeah. and think until his family is ready to reveal That's that, right. then we should focus in on the prayers and the thoughts and, and keeping him and his family uh, lifted. But uh, it just feels a little bit more heavier uh, and more serious than you know, the, the, the PR, if yeah. you will. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and Jamie Foxx feels like a member of the family. We've been, Absolutely. You know, we've been watching Jamie Foxx entertain us for decades, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, he's one of those folks that we feel a deep kinship with. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you know, we're all really concerned, yeah. um, but more importantly, we're all really rooting for him. And this happened in the midst of him filming down in Atlanta, yeah. real big A-lister uh, type movie, and it looks like his double, who, who looks a lot like, you know, Jamie Foxx, and that's what doubles are supposed to. Yeah. He's been getting a lot of more action uh, than than normal. Uh, with them trying to you know piece piecemeal this this film together and do as much as they can uh, while Jamie uh, recovers. So um, yeah, lots of folks uh, are really praying and, and uh, hoping the best for him. Get well soon, Jamie Foxx. Absolutely. All right, a growing number of musicians are not too happy with the recent surge of AI generated songs on social media. My homie Eminem, Drake, Jay-Z, and Rihanna have all fallen victim to this new trend. Now, Drake's voice was recently used for an AI-generated song featuring him and The Weeknd. The fake Drake song wrapped up 600,000 streams on Spotify and millions of views on TikTok. The song was created by an artificial intelligence imposter, and the song has since been pulled from streaming services. This is very dangerous. It, it, well, somebody's about to catch a case. This is, and this, is yeah. a, this is an interesting intellectual property case, because mm -hmm. if you're using you know, the voice of an artist, the mm -hmm. likeness and image of an artist, um, you know, but you know, it's not a person that's using it. It's mm -hmm. a technology mm -hmm. that's using it. Um, you know, who does that artist sort of go after? Yeah. You know, in order to uh, to to be compensated uh, for their art. For me, the jury is still out on AI. I understand the technology is supposed to be of of benefit and to enhance humanity, but but I don't, I don't know because when it's used for for evil instead of good, this is the result. There's also something out called deep fake and. Mm -hmm. And it's deep fake and it's porn where they are taking celebrities and public figures uh, faces and putting them on adult film stars, oh you know, it, it, you know, in, in the act. And that is uh, causing uh, major, major problems. However, uh, it's continuing and it's growing because it is so profitable. So, you know, this AI thing is is much bigger and, and the scope of the damage um, it looks to be pretty huge if there's not some kind of handle on it. You know, there's probably soon to be some kind of, you know, policy or sanction yeah. as people's lives are sort of kind of disrupted and, and ruined or cheated out mm -hmm. of, out of, out of, you know, money that yeah. they would deserve. I mean, and I was going to say, I mean, you know, this is all happening at a time where Congress is actually taking a look, you know, at what it looks like to regulate or legislate mm -hmm. uh, related to AI power technologies. Mm -hmm. They're also looking at other opportunities to to regulate uh, the tech industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so just like any technology, you know, there are good uses of it mm -hmm. and there are, you know, uh, bad uses but of it. But it's something and, about and, this and, AI thing that's just a little scary to me if they don't get a hold on it as it continues to develop and progress and get popular. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. we'll continue to follow it. Uh, well, Frank Ocean will not be on the Coachella stage this weekend oh, after no. sustaining two fractures and a sprain in his left leg. Yikes. His representatives provided a statement to TMZ which said that he suffered the injuries on site leading up to the first weekend of shows. The injuries forced him to rework the set, which left some fans a little disappointed. Hmm. Blink-182 will reportedly fill in as the Sunday night Headliner. But I've never known Mr. Ocean to like uh -oh. dance and uh -oh. jump uh -oh. around I knew and stuff. Say that. I knew you so were say I think that. if it, but he has great, you know, musicality and instrumentation and stuff and he's creative. 
um, just come and sit in the chair and Ooh. sing the songs to the Coachella. Coachella is so huge nowadays, it and it's such just this iconic, you know, gathering. Um, a sprained ankle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just go sit in the chair and you, sing. You know what this made me think of? What? Remember, remember years ago. This was, I think, in the nineties. I would leave that money on the table. This was a, this was in the nineties. I think it was the Soul Train Music Awards. Mm -hmm. and remember when Michael Jackson was report? He was he was reporting. Um, so he was performing. Mm -hmm. uh, he was performing. Remember the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think in the audition or the rehearsal, he had sprained his ankle, mm -hmm. right? But he had still performed during the show and he mm -hmm. was like seated and occasionally he would stand up, right? And so it just made me think back to the old days where uh. folks said, you know, the show must go on, yeah. right? And, you know, not to diminish his injuries, you know, but, you know, you know sprained ankle, yeah. you know, isn't I, a broken I, ankle. Like I said, I just right? wouldn't leave that money out there on the stage like that. You better go on and perform. And listen, speaking of Michael Jackson, after his jerry curl burned up, he was at least able to wave and say, I'm good. And I want to say he came out with videos and carrying on thereafter and still had the little patch on his head. So all I'm saying is, I just feel like, Not and I love patch. you, Frank. I love you, Frank. I think your stuff is really good. I just feel like with a sprained ankle, it's crutches or has somebody carry you center stage, sit in a director's chair and cross your legs and sing. Right, and, and I love Get Frank too. Get your Coachella too. check. There's a lot of people who love Frank, and this is Coachella. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, this is this is a major festival, and so I think there's more to this story. Probably, I don't know, could be. Mm. All right, speaking of a, of a story, here it is. It, it doesn't seem as if 50 Cent. Uh, my old school boyfriend in my head, I love me some 50, is going, uh, things aren't going too good with stars, that network. Uh, right now, the media mogul has said he's not doing any more uh, B uh, BMF spinoffs. Uh, 50 Cent, whose real name is Curtis Jackson, of course, also said he's not selling any other shows to stars either. He made the announcement this week on his Instagram page saying he regrets ever working with stars. Wow. Mm. Even uh, though the network has helped launch some of the most successful shows like Power and BMF, he wrote, quote, I have the number one, two, three, and four top TV shows for African-American and Latina households, and I hate that I did them with the wrong people. No word on the cause of the decision from 50, but he sounds like he's been a little upset with them, a little ticked off with them for a minute, because you know, here and there you hear him you know, kind of put things mm -hmm. out there about how disgruntled he's been. And for, for, for folks who don't know, BMF is Black Mafia family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's based right here in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Word mm -hmm. up. I mean, you know, listen, you know, uh, you, you know 50 s sounds like he is speaking with all 10 toes on the ground mm -hmm. and his whole chest. It means it's with his whole heart. I don't know what stars did to upset 50, know. you know, but those are really strong words, and especially considering how much compelling content Stars has put on their network in recent years. Mm -hmm. There was a time where folks were like stars and mm, sort of shrugged their shoulders. Mm -hmm. You know, now you know with a lot of the programming that Fifty has brought to yeah, stars, but also a lot of the programming you know like uh, uh, P Valley, for mm -hmm. example, right? Mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> I love, about, P love P Valley. I love what Uncle you know Clifford. It's time for P Valley to come back too. That's right. Bring I P mean, Valley back now, please. I, I, I hear you, Fifty. But when P Valley comes back, I'm gonna renew my subscription because right. I got to see what's gonna happen with my people. And when it comes back, Uncle Clifford, you gotta come here on Fox News back and forth from here. and give us so the he tea. So he just might come and say hey. And you know he's also a Ghanaian. Oh really? Same tribe so as my father. Go. More reason for you to, for us to give him a call and have him come visit here. Come on, Nico. Yeah, come on through. Indeed. But you know, listen, I, I'm I'm hoping to get the juice. You know, I really would like to know why the fallout and where 50 will land. But he's somebody who, like you say, will always land ten toes down. So it'll be interesting to see if he finds another home. You know, for his for his projects and his creativity. There's no shortage of streaming platforms. No shortage and of people networks. People need and want content. So. Yeah. I think he'll be fine. Who knows? He might even become a, a, a soulmate for real, for real. <laughs> Come on through, 50. <laughs> the greatest tennis player tell of your all story. time tell your story. We'll let you is tell stepping it. into the production world. That's right. Serena Williams is opening her own media wow. company. Williams is continuing to expand that portfolio of hers since leaving the tennis court. The new multimedia company, multimedia production company, will be called 926 Productions and debuted with a first look TV deal. Come on, girl, at Amazon Studios. Mm. Serena says with this new venture, she aims to elevate female and diverse voices throughout content that speaks to everyone. We love to see it. The GOAT, 
Uh, and you know, there, there's been you know rumors that maybe, and she might even hinted or or said it herself that she would maybe try to return uh, to the tennis court. You know, I'm not going you know say whether she should or shouldn't, can or or or, or can't. But um, I love to see that she is flourishing in, in, in other areas that might, you know, keep her off the court. But when you are such a competitor and just such a beast, sometimes you want to go back just to maybe just prove it to yourself. Hence, you got Tiger Woods still on the golf course. Mm -hmm. You got Michael Jordan who came back, uh, you know, with the Wizards, you know, and, and those type of comebacks. So I don't know. But in the mean and in between, she's still making waves. As, as the goat in, in other areas now. And that's, that's always good to see. And Her I and, and sis. And I just, I just love that, that she's always challenging herself, mm -hmm. not just on the court, but off the court, mm -hmm. right? And she's, mm -hmm. she's not afraid of sort of reimagining sort of her next chapter mm -hmm. and embracing all the plot twists in her life. And so I think whatever it is that she decides to do, she's gonna bring that same energy, that same sense of competition uh, to what she's doing. And so, you know, kudos to, did, to Serena Williams. Did you know she has a Michigan connection right up the way an hour and a half their family is based in Saginaw Michigan I did not know that yeah, right I just up knew the way. I just knew about the Compton connection oh but right. yeah there's a because the Williams family is much celebrated yeah. in, in Los Angeles yeah uh, in Saginaw Michigan as well yeah and they would they would I have a friend who's a cousin and so they would you know still frequent Saginaw I don't know if they do it now but you know coming up that was family family Saginaw, oh, wow. Michigan. Oh, all yeah. right mm. We love hmm. to hear it. Up next, it's black excellence like you've never seen it before. Never, never. Never, ever, never. <laughs> You'll meet the 60-year-old black woman who is breaking world records with ease. What? Don't you go anywhere. You're watching Fox Souls Black Report. Welcome back to Fox Souls Black Report. A Naples, Florida woman sets a 60 meter event sprinting world record at 60 years old. Man, listen, her name is Johnny Reed and uh, she is sprinting into the record books after setting the world record at the USA Track and Field Masters Championship. It all happened last month. Uh, in Louisville, where Reed dashed 60 meters in 8.49 seconds, breaking that world record. Reed takes her training very seriously, as you can see here. And uh, it helped put her name in the history book, saying, quote, all the mechanics came together all at once. This was my first time ever being so relaxed and it felt amazing. That's There's right. the race right there, Nikola. Look see at her it. smoking I see it. everybody. She's smoking. And, and, and you know what? Reed hopes that her story will inspire others to reach their goals. She's mm -hmm. currently training to compete in the senior games in Alabama this month. Come on, senior games. Where are they airing that? I don't feel like 60 is senior. Like I know some sex, sexy, sexy, sixty-year-olds. Year you can be, well. I don't think. I don't That's think they're. I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I think you can be sexy and you can be over sixty. That's what I'm saying. I, but I don't think sixty is senior, though. However, if they say what fifty plus is senior, I will take the benefits, though. Because <laughs> let me tell you something. I turned fifty a couple of years ago, and that AARP card, hotel, and renting cars and stuff. So even though I don't feel senior, I don't think I look senior. I'll take it because of the benefits. <laughs> Any, do, do you have another AARP commercial right here, a little PSA for AARP? I might, because those <laughs> benefits are fantastic. All right, a former garage truck worker is set to graduate from law school this year. 27-year-old Rehan Staten from Maryland is gaining national attention as he will earn his law degree from Harvard Law School. We love to hear it. He was not accepted into any colleges so to help support his family, he got a job at a trash removal service company, but still had a desire to attend college. Staten was hesitant, but with the help of his boss, he got into Bowie State University, then later transferred to the University of Maryland while keeping his job mm. to pay for school. Ultimately, he was accepted into Harvard and will graduate in a couple of weeks. His story caught the attention of uh, so many folks across uh, social media, including media mogul Tyler Perry, who personally called him and offered to pay off his law school education. In 
Incredible, incredible. Talk about that can-do spirit, mm -hmm. right? Going going from being, you know, a trash collector to being a Harvard Law graduate, yeah. right? That is no easy feat. Yeah. Hats off uh, to him for staying the course. And he's also started something, I wrote it down here real quick, the Reciprocity Effect, where um, it's a nonprofit and they raise money to help other uh, folks who work in janitorial service who want to hire their education. Mm -hmm. And they've partnered with Howard to uh, start uh, helping those folks out. So that's, that's a good look. That's incredible. The National Action Network has been fighting and marching for civil rights since 1991. They wrapped up their 32nd annual convention of top government officials, faith and civil rights leaders, and grassroots organizers addressing racial justice and meaningful forms of action. So during one of the panels, our general manager right here at Fox Soul, James DuBose, gave this response when asked about amplifying our voices. Take a listen. James, you've spent the last few years really building Fox Soul from the ground up. I'd love to hear your philosophy. How do you find that, that right mix of programming that inspires, that uplifts, but also gets people to tune in and watch and continue to watch and engage? Right. Um, the main thing is being able to showcase the totality of the black community. Because every, most times, everywhere else, they show one part of us. Um, they don't show the excellence that we do every day. Outside of that, I want to make sure the one thing we've had, in my opinion, in the community is our voices have been muted for too long. So I wanted to unmute the voices, speak how we want to speak, let our emotions come out without anybody judging us or telling us what we can and can't say. And let's be honest, Fox Soul at Fox <laughs> at that time wasn't the most popular thing in the world. Um, but the one thing that was not going to happen was I was just going to be a black face and people that are not of the culture pulling the strings behind the scenes. That was not ever going to happen. And to their credit, they have not done that. They gave me their word. And we've been able to do the stories we want to do for our culture, for our community. But most importantly, show the diversity, the greatness of our culture, and not just the psychologically debilitated stuff that you see everywhere else. You know, we oftentimes say it's an honor to sit behind this desk to be able to take you on a journey across black America and to, to, to feature our rhythm and our blues, right? There's so many other places you can go, mm -hmm. you know, where you're going to hear sad stories about what's happening in our community, but we also want to share stories that encourage you, uh, that uplift, uh, that uplift mm -hmm. and that share stories that, you know, you, you wouldn't see in a lot of other places. And to James's credit, to the credit of the leadership here at Fox Soul, um, each and every day, we've been empowered to do that right here at this desk. Sure, so I hope uh, you got some of that today. I'm Courtney Hicks. And I'm the Cordelai Corte. Until next time, on behalf of everyone here at Fox Soul's Black Report, stay lifted. And stay safe. We'll see you soon.